So our next speaker is Dr. Bjorn Hendricks. We've been very much looking forward to his talk as well. And he's going to talk to us about overcoming dysfunctional oocyte cytoplasm, which a lot of us have worried about for a very long time. And I've asked Dr. Hendricks to let us know his background um, so that he's going to introduce him, his set himself. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, so to introduce myself, it's not so difficult. I was born in Belgium in Bruges and I did my studies in Ghent, which is quite close to Bruges. And I did my first job in IVF. Uh, so I started in 1999 uh, in Ghent IVF Center. I did my PhD there and I stayed there. They liked me, so I stayed there. Yeah, a little closer. Is it better now? Yeah. yeah, so when I started my career, yeah, I had two role models because in 1999, it was very famous to do cloning. So Dolly the Sheep was cloned. So Keith Campbell was a role model for me. And yeah, he became a good friend afterwards. Uh, unfortunately, he died too, too early. And then also Yanaki Machi, he was a famous, famous pioneer in micromanipulation. And afterwards, yeah, I moved to more, yeah, I did cloning in my PhD research, but afterwards I moved more to IVF translational research. And I had two new role models. And one of them was David and Giampiero. So I, I feel a little bit nervous to, to present in front of my two heroes. So enough sentimental stuff. Okay, so I will talk a little bit about this topic of two topics that are yeah, occurring uh, nowadays in the IVM lab. And I also have a tendency to go over time, so please interrupt me if I do. Um, this one was on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, you all know this uh, magazine, of course. Uh, it was discussing the future of babies, and it was discussing mainly three topics, gene editing, uterus transplantation and the three biological parents. The last topic I will present a little bit today is, and we do all these topics in our department, actually. So our focus, we have a small research group of 10 to 12 people, mostly PhD students, and we focus on difficult to treat patients. So patients that come into our IVF clinic and that we still have difficulties to treat successfully. So half, yeah, before half of our research was focused on stem cells and trying to make new gametes, but yeah, we left a little bit this uh, topic because it's expensive research and uh, progress is uh, very slow. Uh, so we are now doing more clinical translational research. Uh, you see some topics here mentioned uh, and the topics today I will present is this failed fertilization after ICSI and embryo development and the rest. And since four years, yeah, we also started to do some gene editing in embryos, but it's, it's of course for fundamental uh, basic research purposes. So I don't have to explain to you probably, I don't know if you're all involved in the IVF, I think so. Um, ICSI is normally very efficient. We do a lot of ICSI in Belgium. 80% uh, of all the cycles are ICSI cycles in Belgium, also in our center. And yeah, for most couples, we get a high fertilization rate of around 75% and good blastocyst rates around 45, 50%. But still, yeah, we have some challenging patients. Eh? For example, patients that have oocyte maturation arrest. So if you do stimulation pickup, you only retrieve GV oocytes and one oocytes. That's very hard to treat couples. Then we have couples facing fertilization failure. Well, we are quite successful in applying some technique to overcome this, I will present to you. But still a major challenging group is uh, patient couples, which shows very bad embryo development. So embryos that, yeah, that show very bad embryo quality at day two, day three. So they really suspect an oocyte problem or embryos that don't make it at all to blastocysts in recurrent cycles. So that's uh, a target population that we concentrate on. 
So I think uh, Jean Piero will talk about also failed fertilization this afternoon. Um, so it happens eh? in the literature says in one to five percent of ICSI cycles, you have low or total failed fertilization. So uh, fertilization needs oocyte activation. I think you all know this. Uh, so normally, when the sperm enters the oocytes, there is a protein coming free. Uh, the sperm factor, which is called PLC zeta, phospholipase C zeta, it produces IP3, inositol 3 phosphate, which will bind to its receptor present in the oocyte, and this will cause calcium oscillation. So, calcium rises during a few hours. Eh? And this is, yeah, the start of fertilization. That's the hallmark of oocyte activation. This you need normally to have successful fertilization. So some patients have problems, for example, in the sperm factor, this PLC zeta that they have mutations, so this functional protein. Oocyte factor, yeah, we still don't know much about it, but yeah, some patients show absence of calcium rises and so failed fertilization. Huh? Um, yeah, uh, our colleagues from Oxford, uh, they made a knockout model, John Parrington and his group, we also collaborated in this study. Uh, yeah, they made a knockout mouse model to prove that this PLC factor is the factor uh, necessary for fertilization. And yes, uh, when they, they made knockout sperm, when we inject them into mouse oocytes, uh, this knockout sperm, we see no calcium rises compared to the wild type, of course. So we see no calcium lives, no activation, and no fertilization, so no embryo development. Remarkably, when we do in vivo mating with this knockout male mice with PLC zeta, they do produce offspring. So at a smaller size as wild type mouse. So that's still puzzling for us. Is it species specific? Because the patients that we see in our clinic when they try in vivo, they don't get uh, fertilization. Um, these patients with PLC mutations, which are comparable to this uh, knockout mice. So in mice, yeah, there is, seems to be a repair. They have some repair mechanism or maybe some other sperm factors that can, can take it over from this PLC zeta. So that's still something that we should figure out. So what do we do when couples present with failed fertilization? Yeah, we are quite well known for this topic and we have a lot of abroad patients coming to our center with this problem, problematic thing. Uh, so yeah, we do a mouse oocyte activation test in which we inject some human sperm into mouse oocytes to see if they can activate at least uh, mouse oocytes. And also recently, uh, before we screened some genes, but now we have a panel of 40 genes uh, that we are using to screen some sperm factors. ACT-L is also a new factor leading to failed fertilization, but mainly we now screen for maternal factors. So these uh, tests, yeah, just quickly, we inject uh, mouse sperm into uh, human sperm into mouse oocytes, and the next day we check how many have cleaved, and that's activation of the oocytes. And then we divide them by groups. So patients that most of the sperm cannot activate uh, a mouse oocytes, we call them what group one. So that's definitely a sperm problem. Then what group two, some sperm can activate a mouse egg, some sperm cannot. So it's reduced, we call them what group two. And what group three, uh, that's all the sperm can activate a mouse oocyte in this patient. So there we suspect an oocyte factor. Yeah, we also do some calcium analysis uh, using mouse oocytes or some human oocytes, but yeah, that's not so important for the topic today. So can we overcome failed fertilization or low fertilization? Yes, uh, we have this protocol called assisted oocyte activation that we artificially induce calcium rises. Uh, during ICSI. Um, well, in Europe, it's a lot done in IVF labs, uh, and most people are using this ready to use calcium. Medicine. It's from a company, it's EU marked, uh, but we don't use it because it's not working in our hands. So we prepare it ourselves. We use ionomycin, which is a calcium ionophore, which is capable of uh, inducing a big calcium rise. 
Of course, this does not mimic the physiolo physiological PNC theta factor because it's only a few rises. Um, so yeah, a lot of people using different protocols in this. Yeah, this was a review uh, discussing all the artificial activating agents that you can use for this, but also used in cloning or partenogenesis. Genesis. Uh, strontium is the most effective to activate mouse oocytes, but it's not working in our hands, at least in human, because some studies use it for human, but we don't see calcium rights. This calcium is in, it's the commercial one, um, which is not so effective in our hands, and we use this ionomycin. Huh? So what we do in our clinic is, uh, together with sperm, we inject a volume of calcium uh, during ICSI. So that gives a first calcium rise, a big one. And then we expose the injected oocytes two times to ionomycin, which provokes another two peaks that you see here. Huh? So it's quite efficient. Eh? If you see the fertilization rates in this table, um, which was published in 2019, an update of all our results. You see in this one group one with sperm factor, the fertilization goes up from 9% to 70%. So actually quite normal in this MOAD group one. In MOAD group two, it's also uh, much more increased fertilization rates from 15% to 63%. And also in MOAD group three, where we suspect an oocyte factor, it's also significant significantly increase from 17 to 57 percent and yeah of course more important the pregnancy rates which you see here in the um, in the last row uh, so in the more group one it's very successful we get a pregnancy rate uh, of uh, 49 percent so almost 50 percent after doing this AOA what group two is a little bit less around 35 percent and more group three close to 30% pregnancy rate, yeah. But compared to without AOA, it's much higher, of course. Huh? So it's working quite efficient. Huh? Yeah, this commercial cold active, it's giving, it's uh, depicted here, the calcium rise in orange with this commercial cold active. It's giving a calcium rise, but not, in a, uh, not so much as ionomycin in blue. And so, yeah, we see no activation. And even in mouse oocytes, we see no activation happening. So it's not working and it's used a lot in the world. Um, yeah, a lot of labs are using it, especially in Europe, uh, this AOA. But yeah, a lot of labs also use it or in other countries for all kinds of fertility indications. For example, this article, they do it, yeah, for all these fertility indications that you see there, OAT, advanced age, POI, PCOS, so actually for almost all fertility indications. For OAT, they saw a higher fertilization percentage with AOA in the other indications, nothing. But especially in the live birth, live birth rates, they claim that almost for every indication, they get a higher live birth rate doing AOA. Uh, yeah. I have some suspicions with this uh, with this data, and we should not use it for all these kind of indications. Um, so, if there is a problem with calcium patterns, no calcium rises, uh, AOA works for most of the couples. I would say ninety five percent it works. And, but still, after the calcium rises, there are a lot of things that need to happen in the oocyte to have successful fertilization. So downstream, cap kinase activation, uh, yeah, you see them here, I will not go into detail, but a lot of proteins are necessary and need to be functional to have successful fertilization after all. Uh, after all. So if there is something wrong here in one of these oocyte proteins, you will not have fertilization. So these are the cases where AOA will not help. Huh? Uh, now, for example, one of these proteins is WEE2. Um, a lot of Chinese studies are doing genetic screening nowadays and find a lot of new mutations causing failed fertilization. For example, in this WEE2, which is downstream of the calcium oscillations, a lot of uh, mutations are being reported. Um, yeah, you see here the function of WEE2. 
Also, PATO2 is another one, also a specific uh, mRNA binding protein, uh, which is causing oocyte arrest or fertilization failure. So mutations have been identified also in this top eight, which is more responsible for spindle formation, but also if you have mutations there, also can lead to fertilization failure. So for example, in this WEE2, uh, they published five uh, couples here. And mostly uh, here you see the number of M2 oocytes that these couples have. And you see it's always almost zero fertilization, even in some of the cycles they tried the AOA, but still zero. Only in one couple, this couple two, they got some fertilization, three on 15 oocytes and three on 15, but yeah, very low, of course. So in this uh, article, they designed uh, recombinant WEE2 and they injected it in the oocytes. And for the first time, they saw that they got fertilization and some embryo development. Here you see uh, two blasts. They are a little bit ugly, if you ask me. Uh, but still, it shows that yeah, when you identify the mutation, the gene, if you would use recombinant RNA or protein, you inject it in the oocytes, you could overcome the problem in this patient. But of course, yeah, for this, you need to uh, know for sure which mutation it is, and then you have to make the recombinant one. So is there another more easy technology? So I believe, and also other people believe in this nuclear transfer technology. Um, I think you might have heard of it. They also call it in the popular media, the tree parent baby, which is a little bit uh, a term that I don't like. Um, so what is the idea with this nuclear transfer? Uh, if you have an oocyte with bad cytoplasma or bad mitochondrial DNA, for example, you replace the cytoplasma. So you take out the nucleus, the DNA, which is not affected in this oocyte, and you put it in an empty donor egg with green, good cytoplasma, healthy cytoplasma. So you need donor oocytes for this. Uh, you put the nuclei from the affected oocyte in the donor, empty oocyte or cycles. You fertilize it with the sperm of the partner and you have this nuclear transfer embryo with nuclear DNA coming from the deceased mother uh, here and the nuclear DNA from the sperm. And then, yeah, why they call it the three parents? Well, the mitochondrial DNA is coming from the donor oocyte. Yeah? So you can do this technique on different stages uh, on the immature oocytes, uh, GV transfer on uh, the meta phase two, spindle transfer, after fertilization for nuclear transfer, or some people are also investigating to use the polar bodies uh, to do this uh, reconstruction of all sense. Uh, of course, yeah, if you do this, it's extensive micro manipulation. It's not just like ICSI. Uh, you should have no effect on embryo development and potential. Yeah, in cases of mitochondrial diseases, yeah, you should minimize the number of mitochondria that is still being transferred when you do this nuclear transfer. And of course, the technique should be safe uh, to use. Eh? When you transfer the nucleus, for example, the spindle or the pronuclei, you will also always have some small surrounding cytoplasma. And for example, for mitochondrial diseases, uh, you can also transfer some mutated copies still when you do the transfer. But this is quite minimal, uh, as studies have proven. So, yeah, spindle transfer for people that are not familiar. Uh, you see here an oocyte uh, visualized with the uh, oscope imaging. You know this, David. Uh, so you can take out the spindle and you put it uh, in a donor egg, which was inundated, and you fertilize it, and you have an embryo. So sometimes you can do pronuclear transfer. It's the same principle, but first you uh, fertilize the diseased egg and also the donor egg. And then at the zygote stage, you switch the pronuclei. So you take out the pronuclei from the diseased zygote and you put it in an empty donor zygote. Okay, so a lot of studies have been done and mouse studies, also human studies, uh, and it's proved to be safe, no effect on embryo development and so on. Also, we have done some research on this. So it was originally intended for mitochondrial diseases. Huh? We published in this article in 2017, but yeah, 
there we already said that maybe for some fertility problems, we could use this technique. Have, has a baby been born? Yes. Uh, this one was the first baby from Dr. Zhang. Yeah, in, in the States, it's not allowed to do it, nuclear transfer. So he went to a Mexican lab uh, to do it. Uh, so he did spindle transfer for a patient with uh, mitochondrial disease. So she, yeah, these mitochondrial diseases are very devastating sometimes. So this uh, woman had already four pregnancy losses and two diseased children at a very old age, I have eight months and six years. She's not affected. She has a quite a low mutation load in her fluids, uh, so she's asymptomatic, but still she produces oocytes, which are all containing 100% mutated uh, mitochondrial DNA copies. So they did the spindle transfer, they transferred back an embryo, and they saw that 5% was still transferred uh, of these bad copies. And yeah, it resulted in a, a healthy baby with very low mutation loads. Um, in his uh, tissue. So can we also use it for certain infertility indications? We think so. And which patients? Well, patients that we now have to send for oocyte donation. So for example, yeah, oocyte maturation arrests, we cannot treat it right now. So we send them to oocyte donation. This failed fertilization, if AOA doesn't work, Embryo developmental arrest, so people that never have a good embryo, never have a blastocyst, yeah, they don't get pregnant, of course. So also these we sent to uh, oocyte donation. Aged woman, yeah, that's still a big question, or RIF or RPL patients, yeah. We still don't know for which patients. Um, we did some, we had a case, uh, yeah, we had two cases with AOA failure, huh? so where we suspect an oocyte problem. Uh, downstream of the calcium rises, and we did spindle transfer in these two patients who had failed fertilization. Um, so, yeah, we got some oocytes or in vitro matured oocytes from this patient to, to try the technique to see if we get fertilization with doing this transfer. And yes, uh, so in the first couple, um, she had 12 oocytes, uh, 17 oocytes, 12 mature and 5M1, so the 5M1 she gave to us for research. We did spindle transfer, and yeah, after AOA, nothing fertilized, but after doing the spindle transfer to another oocyte, we got for the first time fertilization in this couple. Research context, we can not transfer back to the animals. Also in the other couple, nothing fertilized after AOA, but after doing this nuclear transfer to other oocytes, we got successful fertilization for the first time uh, in these two couples. Uh, for embryo developmental arrests, well, we are, yeah, we are, don't have so much data yet. Uh, we know, uh, yeah, we know more and more genes which are crucial, the oocyte factors which are crucial for the early cleavages. You see some names here. Um, so yeah, there are more and more genes identified which are crucial for the first steps of fertilization or embryonic development. But oocyte is complex, of course. It, it contains, yeah, thousands, uh, yeah, thousands, I checked it yesterday, 2,000, 3,000 proteins uh, in, the, in the human oocyte. Uh, and they are all very important for maturation, fertilization, and directing embryonic development. Um, so, for example, in this case, uh, also Chinese study. Yeah, Chinese are coming up with new mutations almost every week. So, in these uh, two couples, you see they had a mutation in yeah NLRR5 and one and two, um, and you see very bad embryo development. Day on day two, yeah, you can hardly call it an embryo, it's fragmented a lot, so on day three, you see these uh, very ugly embryos and they don't make it to blastocysts, of course. Yeah? So we did a study in a mouse model who had, yeah, this uh, NZB strain, it's always showing, or the majority, two cell block. They go to two cell and then they block. Yeah? 
So we transferred uh, the site of the nuclei to another cytoplasma from a strain that is developing well uh, to check if this nuclear transfer could overcome this uh, two cell block. And indeed, when transferring, um, yeah, you see plasmid strain is very minimal in this uh, strain. So it's mostly to showing two cell block. So only 9% develops the blastus. But if we do nuclear transfer to a good cytoplasma, we can increase it to normal rates, 90% blast cyst rates. You know? Also, we have used it recently from all sites coming from ovarian tissue, uh, so from transgender uh, men. Uh, we know that these oocytes, when we collect the ovaries and we recruit some oocytes, this auto ovarian tissue oocytes, yeah, they are very bad. Uh, they develop hardly two blasts. They have nothing, zero or 19. But when we did spindle transfer to a better quality oocyte, we got 20% uh, blastus rate, which is still not so high. But yeah, the recipients that we are using, it's not real donor oocytes. It's just spare material that we get from other patients. But still, yeah, it proves that you can overcome cytoplasmic immaturity with the nuclear transfer. And this was actually a similar study now recently published in monkeys, which showed the same thing. So if you use in vivo matured oocyte blastus rates are very high, around 60%. If you use in vitro matured monkey oocytes, yeah, it's almost 0%. But if you do transfer the spindle transfer, you get a much higher rate of embryo development. Um, so our doctor Zhang also did it for the first time for infertility uh, in China. He did it that time. Uh, it was an older study. It was only published in 2016. So this couple always had a two cell arrest. When you did fertilization, two cell formation uh, and then stop. Uh, so they did uh, this uh, nuclear transfer, uh, PNT, they did pro-nuclear transfer, they did, uh, they got seven, nuclear transfer embryos and yeah unfortunately they transferred back five embryos which was yeah too much of course it's a new technique five embryos to transfer back it resulted in a triplet pregnancy they tried to do a reduction to higher the chances of a triplet pregnancy but finally yeah it resulted in a non uh, viable delivery so that was not successful but this year a study came out from our Greek, uh, it was done in a Greek center, but actually it's, yeah, Nuno. He's a Portuguese uh, researcher working in Spain normally, but Spain, you can also not do this nuclear transfer technology. So they went to Greece to do the study um, and they got some very fascinating results, if you ask me. It was published in Fertility Sterility. I think, I think it deserved a much higher journal uh, to my so what they have done, uh, they treated 25 couples uh, with spindle transfer and they used really good donor eggs. So they recruited donors and these patients all had or low fertilization or embryo developmental arrest. So most of these couples never had a blast cyst after normal ICSI. So these couples, 25 couples, they had a long history. So together they underwent 159 59 cycle attempts without any pregnancy, of course, and hardly any embryo, hardly any blastus development. So when they did the spindle transfer, they got 63% blastus, 63 rate. So compared to almost zero, for me, amazing results. They did uh, 19 embryo transfers in this 25 couples, and they got seven clinical pregnancies and six live births. So a very high efficiency. For couples that actually don't have any chance anymore of uh, their own genetic child, only by this doing this spindle transfer, they are now um, having their own genetic uh, child uh, still a chance. So for me, amazing results. Huh? Um, they measured the carryover. It was not for mitochondrial diseases, so it was not really necessary to do this, but they wanted to learn uh, from this experiment to, to use it for mitochondrial diseases. And in all the embryos, the carryover was very minimal, 1% they, they uh, saw, uh, so very minimal. 
But what was a little bit uh, worrying that in one of the six children born, the 1% after birth um, increased again to 40 to 60%. So yeah, that's still very puzzling how this can happen. How frequent does this happen? So in case of infertility, it's no problem because it goes back to the maternal, I mean, from the disease, I mean, from the infertile mother, the mitochondrial DNA genotype. But if you use it for mitochondrial diseases, yeah, this is a worry. Huh? So we still need to understand uh, more. Yeah, um, I see Anne already rising up. I will uh, finish. Um, so... My good colleague, he's a good friend of me, Thomas Appler from uh, Europe, uh, Austria. Yeah, he, he published an interesting study that using AOA, he could overcome embryo developmental arrest. Uh, yeah, he had some nice results uh, when doing AOA, ionophore cycle. In patients with embryo developmental arrest, the uh, the pregnancy rate, implantation rate uh, was significantly increased uh, from five to 23 uh, percentages or in, uh, here 12 to 45 and 12 to 44 percent. Yeah, which is quite remarkable. We repeated this study and unfortunately we don't see this. Doing AOA, we cannot come over uh, EDA, so embryo developmental arrest. Huh? Um, yeah, this one I will skip, um, but I don't think we will be able to rescue nuclear, uh, advanced maternal age with nuclear transfer because, yeah, you know, advanced maternal age, the spindles are already very much affected, so I don't, cytoplasma will be uh, <laughs> suffered from aging, and we did this mouse study showing this. But yeah, I don't think uh, we will have nice results for this uh, advanced maternal age because yeah, Ukraine group has done it a lot also, this nuclear transfer, but it's not published yet. But I know from them, because I have some contact with them, that it's not working for advanced maternal age. Okay, uh, yeah, we will continue this study also in our clinic. We just got some good funding. Uh, to try it in still in research context. So we will now recruit good donors and recruit patients who have these problems of failed fertilization and embryo development and the rest. And yeah, we will recruit good donors to show that it's really yeah helping these couples only in research context because ethical committee is a little bit skeptic about this technique and they don't want to give us a green light yet. So if you're a PhD candidate or a postdoc, we're still recruiting. Uh, I st still didn't find any good candidates, so please contact me. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, there are of course some concerns of using this. It's a new technology, but a lot of animal research has been done. There are some legal ethical constraints here. In a lot of countries, it's not allowed to do it. Uh, safety concerns. I think we should first do it for infertility and learn more before we do it actually for mitochondrial diseases. Yeah, the question is for which infertility indication. So we hope with our research we can uh, show uh, some uh, evidence for which female patients it can work. So I just wonder who is supporting this, uh, this clinical use. So already transferring back nuclear transfer embryos to patients. Who is saying, no, we should not do it at this time? Yes, the older people, sorry for that, <laughs> say yes. So we have youngsters who are more progressive. Uh, so you think we should do it for both mitochondrial diseases and infertility? Yeah, some more hands. Only for infertility at the moment. I say, I do this, yes. Um, or only for mitochondrial diseases. Yeah, that's no one. Okay, thank you. That's interesting to know. So I want to thank uh, our team uh, doing this nice research. Uh, and thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Bjorn. We have time for about one question. We have our time constraint now is that our noon speaker has to catch a plane. And I want you to be able to listen to Dr. Wickler. But we have time for one or two quick questions. David, your questions are almost never quick. <laughs> is this quick? Okay. Great talk. It's really interesting. I'm curious to say that in the absence of mitochondrial uh, mutation indication that it's denied. Uh, and yet, uh, a paper published is not an unknown germ cell, but the real expert at mitochondria, Doug Wallace. We're using neutral polymorphism between two strains of mice. Show that um, a heterolapse in the mixture uh, between you know, these two types led to profound behavioral changes in the offspring. So, 80, 20% of them may be used by the brain. The you know, models for autism, models for depression all came out, and it wasn't that it was different. It's just the nuclear encoded transcription factors regulating mitochondrial function. When they find a different substrate, not surprising, they there's a major biological rationale for this too. So I thought, how, how do you yeah. do that? I mean, you can have all these kids for 30 years yeah. to see if they get uh, depressed or autistic. Yes, well, uh, to repeat the question shortly, um, there was a study that showed that uh, heteroplasmy between, uh, yeah, some mixture between mouse with some specific uh, SNPs. Uh, show that uh, they had an effect of uh, on neuro, neuro, neuronal uh, behavior, you know, autism and so on. Uh, I'm aware of this study. Um, yeah. And David was asking, yeah, we should do a lot of follow-up if we do this study. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, that's one of the paramount things that we will do. And I hope other people will also do that. We do a detailed follow-up. Well, these nuclear mitochondrial interactions, they are very complex. Uh, it's a whole research field focusing on this, but a lot of nuclear transfer studies have been done that they mix uh, nuclear background to another uh, mitochondrial background. And there you don't see these uh, abnormal things. So yeah, maybe it has to do with certain SNPs in the uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, that could conflict with uh, nuclear DNA. But yeah, I'm not convinced yet about this one study that showed uh, some abnormalities, but we should be aware of it. Uh, to uh, not how to get cancer and which method to use Ah, yes. Well, you mean in a uh, mouse, I suppose. And yes, well, we are now working on a publication. It's on the review, on the revision. So we have this knockout PLC model and we try to correct it with uh, gene editing. So the results will be published quite soon. <laughs> Very sure. Can you see that the sign of responsible for that initially? Do you have any tests that you need to suggest the carbon before going into the Anything that you can say? It's a carbon reaction. Yeah, well, uh, Gian Piero is asking if we can do a diagnostic uh, before we know for sure that we should maybe apply nuclear transfer. Yeah, that's why we'll do, we will do this intensive genetic screening now. So to first identify that we see a mutation in one of these uh, 40 maternal genes that or could be responsible for embryo developmental arrest or uh, failed fertilization. So yeah, that's a real proof that there is a cytoplasmic factor that is missing or dysfunctional. And for this couple, yeah, nuclear transfer would be a good option. So yeah, this genetic screening is, we should do. And uh, I hope other people will also extend this. Thank you very much, Bjorn. Lunch is already here. So I recommend that everybody go and lunch is already ready. And as soon as we sit down with your lunch, we're going to introduce Dr. Wickler, who's our one of the foundation's long-term.